Hey guys, it's Danny. Today it is time to debunk some more orchid myths that you guys sent in over the past few months. Yeah, I didn't run out of them. I will try to answer as many as I can today as well. But of course, you are always welcome to leave me a comment and tell me a myth that you heard about orchids and I will try my best to debunk it in a future video. Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Stay tuned to find out how you can get one month free trial. Alrighty then, so before we start, don't forget to give this video a like if you enjoy it and why not subscribe? I post multiple times a week and it's completely free. Right, let's start. Let's see what great suggestions you guys sent. Oh, here's a great one. Is it true that too much sunlight prevents orchids from producing flowers? And well, I will have to say that is a myth as far as my knowledge goes. Obviously, there are thousands upon thousands of orchid species. I don't know all of them. So if there is one orchid in this vast world that is actually affected by a little too much sun when it comes to flowers, then yeah, there might be. But as far as the more popular orchids go, that is quite the myth, I will have to say. I have seen so, so many times Phalaenopsis or Cattleya orchids or Vandas, higher light orchids generally, but not only, having quite a lot of sunburn on the leaves, or at least a lot of anthocyanin, a lot of red tinges on the leaves, and at the same time having a lot of flowers. So quite intense sunlight or light in general doesn't seem to affect blooming. Quite the contrary, in my experience, it actually kind of enhances blooming. Even orchids which don't require a lot of light, to me, seem like they bloom better if they get a little bit more light than what the specs say, what the user manual <laughs> says, if you will. But obviously, there is such a thing as overdoing it. If by too much sun you mean to the point of actually burning quite a lot of the leaves, then absolutely. Too much sun can definitely contribute to a non-blooming orchid, but indirectly. It affects its health. If the leaf system is almost gone, the orchid is not able to photosynthesize properly, hence it will not have energy to grow, let alone bloom. So if that happens, blooming is the least of our worries. We need to do our best to save the orchid, but it's better to prevent such situations. So I hope this answers your curiosity. I would not be afraid of a little too much light, but beware of burning the leaves. Lexi is wondering if green mold or white fungi are something to be scared of. So to make it a little bit in the format of this video, green mold or white fungi or fungi are something to be afraid of. And well, I will have to say that is a myth because generalizing an entire group of organisms like that is never a good idea. Let's say you have a hundred individuals in this category. If one of them is not harmful, then we cannot say that white fungus is harmful generally. So we kind of have to be more specific. But I will tell you that in my experience, that greenish mold sometimes forms on these bamboo skewers and I never have any issues with them. Yeah, it's gonna form and yeah, it's gonna disappear in a month or two. And by the end, yes, the skewer will be blackened, it will be brittle, it will break down because it is organic but this has never ever affected the roots of my orchids. When it comes to the white mold, I didn't actually have a whole lot of it. Usually white mold forms on dried sheets, on things that are decaying already. Again, that mold doesn't seem to affect anything. It kind of stays on that dried piece of leaf or whatever it may be, sometimes even on roots. And I know it's scary, but in my experience, it has only formed on the already dried parts of the orchid. I've never actually seen any proper damage because of it. What I did see quite a lot of damage of, and I'm not entirely sure if I filmed this, I recently had a really bad infestation of a type of white mold, but it's not the one that I think you're referring to. It looks like it actually has some sort of little mushrooms attached to it, and also it does harbor the yellow mushroom as well. It stinks, smells bad, the one you're referring to most probably does not smell bad. Yeah, that one actually completely obliterated the roots on my Monstera, which is not an orchid, but it is a plant. So I consider that one to be quite bad for plants. But the ones that typically appear in higher humidity conditions or on pieces of wood or bamboo, 
uh, those seem to be okay in my opinion. I would say that you are safe, but just keep an eye on whatever has mold. Typically, if something has mold on it, it is not alive anymore, it is sick, it is dry, and it has been exposed to moisture. Molds love moisture. So because we cannot say which mold is detrimental and which is safe, I'm not going to generalize across the board. Some molds are completely harmless, while others are not. I would go with my nose. If it stinks real, real bad, I would get rid of it. It's also not good for your health. But if it doesn't really smell, it's just a little bit, it kind of goes away, doesn't take over everything, especially the root system and the pot, then I think you're okay. Should put some cream on my hands. My hands are so dry. I don't know if it shows in the video. Sorry if it did. I work a lot with my hands in water. And since water is very hard here, my hands are obliterated. Now, one thing I can assure you is not a myth is today's sponsor, Skillshare. Most of you probably already know that Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of creative and inspiring classes for people who love to learn every day. This is the place where you can explore, expand on, or learn new things like drawing, painting, design, photography, and much more. In the past months of using Skillshare myself, I managed to learn quite a great deal about painting, which has always been something I struggled with, about the process of actually creating videos, about finding my own style and actually being able to take it out of my mind and into the real world, and much, much more. There are so many courses on so, so many different subjects. I really just want to have more hours in a day to be able to view them all. Many of the times it happens that I get inspired by things that I thought would never interest me, but now they do. All the classes are premium, have no ads, and new content is added all the time. If you'd like to try Skillshare, visit the link below and the first 1,000 of you will get a completely free one month trial to the premium membership. So check it out at the link down below. I hope you'll enjoy it. And in the end, thank you all for supporting the people who support my channel. Next up, Music Box Era. I like your thumbnail. I love Mariah Carey. Okay. So they're saying, I don't know if this is a fact, but I heard that after you repot an orchid and some of the mushy or sick roots are removed, the orchids will not continue their bloom. Oh my goodness, that is just a myth. It sounds very complicated as well. All right, so let me try to explain what's happening here. So when you cut dead roots, the orchid doesn't even feel. It's a dead root, it's a mushy root. It's not part of its active important structure anymore. Since it is completely depleted of the substances that the orchid actually detects, it doesn't have hormones, it doesn't have any water pressure, it doesn't have anything in it anymore. It is a dead structure. So if we cut them, it simply doesn't feel them anymore. If the structures are left inside the pot, they will start to break down as any organic structure does, which is not good news for us because our pots are very, very tiny and they don't have nearly all of the microorganisms and bacteria that are necessary for a proper breakdown of organic materials, such as compost piles or compost beans and things of the sort. So it is in the detriment of the orchid to actually leave those structures on. They absolutely do not influence the blooming of an orchid. However, Maybe I can see where somebody made this connection, which for me is like, you have an itch here, you take this hand and you try to scratch yourself like this. That's, that's how it looks like to me. There is a saying in my language about that. Somebody tried to put the pieces together, but it, it's not the way it works. What happens sometimes is that orchids go through a transplant shock, like many other plants. So their roots don't actually adapt to a certain type of medium or a certain environment, case in which they will slowly but surely start to die off and you will be tempted to remove them. But the thing is what happens next is that the blooms might fade much faster as well, not because you removed the roots, but because the plant, the orchid is in shock. The mushy roots have nothing to do with the falling of the flowers, but they are also a product of the orchid being stressed, being shocked, maybe getting a little dehydrated, and whenever dehydration or extreme stress happens, the orchid will start to shed unnecessary structures. And these are flowers. Leaves are important, roots are important, flowers not so much. So the orchid will shed the flowers. So yeah, that's how things are related. But just because you cut the mushy roots does not mean your orchid will drop its flowers. 
It might happen, and it's very likely to happen at the same time, but they all or both have the same root cause. And this is shock, extreme stress, the inability of the orchid to adapt to a new pot, new environment, new medium, and so on and so forth. Oh, here's one that I already feel it's gonna be a little controversial, quote unquote. It's just a popular belief that I knew about when I started this hobby as well, but guess what? I will not agree with it. So, peculiar leaf, I like your nickname. I heard that orchids grow better if they are pot bound in the sense that the pots are exactly the size of the root system or a little smaller. To be more specific, they prefer if the roots are unable to move much. I look forward for your answer. That is a very, very big myth. And actually it has more to do with dendrobiums. It's more common to say this about dendrobiums. Put them in very, very tiny pots because they don't really like big pots and so on and so forth. Ugh, where do I unpack this? First of all, Let's just say that these are my opinions and my experiences as an orchid grower and you have seen all of my history, it's here on YouTube. I'm not making up the fact that I am an orchid grower <laughs> for the past 10 years or so and eight and a half on YouTube. So my experience has not been this, but I do know people who again make this correlation because of what they see and it's just so tempting to make a correlation to see a pattern as humans we are programmed to see patterns so when you see an orchid being super pot bound doing great you say oh it likes to be pot bound well i believe something else is happening here i might be correct i might be not it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things and i just kicked the tripod <laughs> but this is my opinion so Honestly, orchids don't really care if they're pot bound or not. They don't know they're in a pot. Let's try to think about what they do know. They know that all of their roots are attached. They are touching something. They are growing on something, which is a very natural, let's say, pattern for them. Epiphytic orchids, which are most of the orchids we grow, grow on a tree and they extend their roots up and down as far as the eye can see. So from the get-go, if you look at orchids in nature, it is just absurd to say they like to be potted or pot bound because in nature their roots grow as far as the eye can see. But the thing is they grow attached to the tree. They are very well anchored. That is their purpose to anchor the plant apart from absorbing nutrients and water, of course. So the fact that roots start to grow on the sides of the pot in my opinion, is a very similar, let's say, effect to them growing as long as their little heart's desire on a tree trunk or a branch. Nothing compressing them, nothing confining them. What happens to the middle of the pot though? Because the middle of the pot doesn't have sides. Well, in my opinion, that doesn't really matter. If you've ever repotted an older orchid, you might have noticed that the roots concentrate on the sides, even at the bottom. I'm gonna make a mess here. They swirl around at the bottom and on the sides and in the middle there are roots, yes, but not nearly as many as on the sides. Now, when we are talking about really pot-bound orchids, in my mind, we are talking about orchids that don't necessarily have this swirling effect only. It's a pot full of roots and I have had quite a few of them. At that point, you have more roots than medium in my mind. That is not ideal for home growers, especially because it means you need to water that plant quite often since it barely has any potting mix to retain that water. It's just a mass of roots. The orchid will do absolutely fine because again, it does not care. It feels that it's attached on the sides and it doesn't matter, it's pot bound, it doesn't know. We're extending roots, that's what we're doing. Where, I don't know, we're, they're just growing, they have space, they grow, we're happy, kinda is what happens. So in my mind, if an orchid is pot bound, it does not matter, it does not care, we'll be happy. But the person who will not be happy at all is you you're gonna have to water that orchid more and more and more and more and more until you're just gonna water the orchid and the whatever tiny pieces of medium you have left inside won't even get wet because the orchid will absorb whatever the pot is able to hold. So I believe that it's not the pot bound situation that makes the orchid happy, it's the availability of something to stick its roots in or on. Hence why we can actually grow orchids mounted on the pieces of wood. And again, we're not talking about pot bound orchids there. They're growing on a piece of wood and they're doing just fine. 
So whether it's that piece of wood or the sides of the pot, it really doesn't matter for the orchid. As long as that root attaches and grows along the surface, it's happy. The problem is it will be too crowded at some point for your sake. It will be happy, but if you skip watering day, oh, it's not gonna be happy, it's gonna fuss. So I hope I managed to explain this to the best of my abilities. In my mind, all I want for the orchid is to have that surface to attach to, which is the side of the pot. Other than that, I'm happy. I don't need the orchid to be pot bound to be happy. Look at this girl. She is glorious. Most of my orchids are looking glorious and they're not pot bound. I don't like pot bound orchids because they require a lot of watering. See, not pot bound but enough roots to swirl a little bit. That's what I want. And with a bit of luck, we're gonna have the best bloom it ever has since I grew this one from a tiny, tiny little cakey. Next up, Nat is saying, is it true that repotting an orchid in bud or bloom will shorten the lifespan of the flowers? Oh gosh, how should I say this? It is a myth but it is also truth. Again, it's one of those things that we cannot really generalize because it does depend on the specific case. I will explain why. So sometimes when you repot an orchid in bud or bloom, you really don't mess the root system all that much. You take care that the roots don't even feel it, don't even get bruised, don't even get a scratch. Case in which, and particularly when you're dealing with vigorous orchids, you are not actually going to lose the blooms or the buds. Now this doesn't mean that it's a guarantee. There is also a risk of indeed losing the buds. I find buds to be more sensitive than already open blooms. Maybe because the orchid is shedding things that require more energy and open flowers, they don't require as much energy because they're already open. Now, the logic behind that is that when we repot an orchid, which is a pretty traumatic, or it can be a pretty traumatic thing for an orchid, which is used to being in one place, attached to that tree strongly, all of a sudden we repot it, maybe we snap a few roots yeah, it can go into a little bit of a shock, not to mention transplant shock if the medium is a little bit different and the moisture levels are not the same that the roots are adjusted to, some roots will be lost. So it is actually pretty common sometimes to lose buds and flowers because of this transition. But is it a guarantee that it will happen again? No, it is a lottery. So to generalize that repotting will definitely make buds and blooms fall, it's not correct because you don't know, but it is indeed a real possibility for you to lose blooms and flowers. Now, if you can't wait with your repotting, just wait a little bit, enjoy the blooms and flowers, blooms and flowers, <laughs> the buds and the flowers, enjoy them if you really want to get more time with them. And if the orchid is happy, you don't see any reason why the roots would suffer, then yeah, absolutely. Keep it like that for a little more. And then after the blooms fall, just go ahead and repot it. And lastly, a question I've never actually wondered about. That is so interesting. Leanne is saying, older leaves become less stiff as they age. Is that a sign that the orchid is stressed or dehydrated? Oh my gosh, this is not a truth or myth question, uh, but I'm gonna answer it because I find it very interesting. I actually never checked, but it never struck me that older leaves get less stiff. Let me just grab an orchid. All right. Hmm, actually, on this particular Phalaenopsis, the older leaves are indeed less stiff, but not by much, just marginally less stiff. And this orchid is not dehydrated. I just watered my orchids. See, the roots are hydrated, just slightly, slightly more mellow than the newer ones. Although the new leaves can be very mellow as well because they're tender. On this Paphiopetalum though, it really isn't the case. All of the leaves are equally rigid. Well, let me get another one. This is exciting. Okay, here's another Phalaenopsis. The older leaves, again, marginally, marginally limpier than the newer leaves. And again, this is not a dehydrated orchid. I just watered it. So yeah, I guess that is true. It could be the case. It's obviously not going to be the case with all orchids. As you can see, my Paphiopetalum doesn't have that. Maybe with Phalaenopsis, it can happen. But definitely when your orchid is starting to suffer from dehydration, the first leaves that will get limp are the lower leaves. 
the orchids will always prioritize new growth. In the case of Phalaenopsis, it is the crown. In the case of a sympodial orchid, it's the new growth. So it's very logical that in case of dehydration, older growths will get shriveled and mellow and soft. Now, my orchids are not dehydrated, but indeed these are pretty old leaves here and they are just slightly, slightly mellower, but definitely they're not limp and floppy. <laughs> if the lower leaves are quite limpy, I would definitely check the watering regime. Maybe you need to water a little bit more frequent, but yeah, I never actually noticed this. I don't know why. I don't go around pressing on the oldest leaves. I don't even see them because the orchid is already covering them with the new foliage. That is very interesting. Tell you what, you guys go right now to your orchids and feel and touch a little bit the older leaves and tell me if you notice the same thing. Is it just my orchids being maybe slightly dehydrated? Because yeah, what I usually do is don't water enough. <laughs> but I'm curious, I'm curious to know. For now, let's just say it could be truth, but I'm not entirely sure. I wanna know from you guys. So. That is about it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed today's video. Hope you learned something new. And again, if you have myths that you'd like me to talk about and debunk from my own personal experience, just leave them down below in the comment section. So thank you so much for hanging out with me today. And thank you Skillshare for sponsoring yet another video. Subscribe to my channel for more orchid videos, tutorials, experiments, updates, and other fun orchid subjects. If you wish to support the channel, do consider becoming a member or visit the merch store linked down below in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook. It's always nice to stay in touch there as well. And with that said, I'll see you next time. Bye.